Welcome to the launch of our World Reads programme. World Reads aims to encourage readers and wildlife lovers to explore and celebrate the connectedness between both nature, the nature world and the written world. We are thrilled um, at Suffolk Libraries that Suffolk Wildlife Trust are our partners in this fantastic project. We have launched it this week and our first title is the amazing book Swifts and Us by Sarah Gibson. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much, Lisa. It's really lovely to be here for your launch event. We're so lucky. And when we touched upon um, Wildlife Trust, obviously for a long time you worked for a Shropshire Wildlife Trust. Has nature and um, animals and wildlife, has that always been a deep passion of yours? Absolutely. Um, I grew up in a small village in Sussex um, and nature was really all around me. So, yeah, I, I always loved exploring wild places. Um, and, I, and I think I also... Um, in the 70s, I was aware of an awful lot of environmental destruction and that sharpened my desire to ultimately have a career in conservation. And you worked, I think, as a communications officer. Did, for yes. For the Wildlife Trust. But then, you know, you went and wrote a book about swifts. How much, because um, you had a move, um, which I think influenced it, and then you wanted Edward Mayer to come and do a talk, and um, which you found really fascinating. How much did you, do you think those events ultimately influenced you in writing this amazing book? Um, I think I was so impressed by the whole, there's, there's an, and I, this is true of Suffolk, it's true of lots of counties all over the country. There are lots of little groups of people um, working for SWIFTS. And I was as amazed by the people taking action as I was by the birds themselves and their extraordinary lifetime, life, life cycle. Um, Edward is an amazing speaker. He's very passionate and um, enthusiastic. Um, and he's... he's um, He's a great ambassador for Swifts. So yes, it, it was partly inspired by Edward that I would do something, but I was doing things for Swifts a long time before I started writing the book. When we say obviously writing the book, um, I've interviewed so many authors and so many of them are like, you know, five years old, there they are, pen and paper, always dreaming about getting that published book. But that isn't your journey. No. So why, you know, why did you suddenly go, I want to write a book, but a book about Swifts? What what came about with that decision to do that? Um, I've always loved writing. Um, and in my role as a communications officer, I was I was producing the magazine, writing lots of features and things like that. I've always loved writing. I did an English degree. That side of me has always been bubbling away. Um, but I'd never really thought I'd got a book in me. And then suddenly I just switched my mind. I think what it was, I'd had a period of quite a long period of illness, uh, chronic fatigue, nothing malign, but pretty grim. And then I got better and then I had to take a long time off work. Um, but then I went back but only like two days a week. The door was ajar to go back further if, as and when I got better. And that was just like a turning point. I thought, well, actually I could do something different as well as carrying on my two days a week. And it was that point I just thought about writing a book. And I just, from the moment I thought about it, and this sounds a bit cocky really, but I kind of knew I could do it. And it was such a wonderful project because when you tell people you're writing a book, it opens doors. So I got to meet so many interesting people um, and hear their stories and the stories of Swifts. Um, it, was, it was a wonderful project and very exciting that somebody actually wanted to publish the book as well. I find it extraordinary that you didn't find it daunting that you were you were going to write that book. Did you do you feel, Sarah, that like your background when you said about your degree and spending so many years in communications, did that help you oh, in the writing process? Definitely. And also sort of in your role as a wild working for the Wildlife Trust in communication, you're writing in a way that you're kind of wanting to bring people on board with you. Um, and I and 
in a way, it was easier for me to do this as a complete, complete the writing side. I'm slow, I'm a slow writer. It takes me ages to write stuff. I'm quite choosy with my words and things. But um, I didn't know much about scripts at all when I started. But that was, in some ways, it's quite nice to come to things late because then you've got all that discovery to do um, and the excitement of, of learning about these amazing birds or whatever it happens to be. I mean, you say like all that you've learned, your book is so extraordinarily rich with detail and the history. And was, again, like that writing process, was research an aspect that you really enjoyed digging into and oh, finding absolutely. out all these extraordinary things? I love doing the research. It's it's fascinating. You know, and you just follow so many different leads and then people tell you about someone else you need to talk to or um, the, holid the holidays me and my partner had, we just arranged holidays around interesting places, swift people in Europe to meet. Um, so it was done over a number of years, um, but it was it was such a enriching time. Yes. When you say about arranging holidays, I have a, a colleague I used to work with, who used to do that with holidays and libraries. They used to visit libraries all over the world. <laughs> So when, when you've got that passion with you, yes, I think that's amazing. Yes. How long did the research take you? Because there is so much information in this book, absolutely fascinating. But I mean, I guess, where do you stop? At what point do you go, okay? Because I know there was more research that came, you know, there's more things that have come since. So yes. at what point did you sort of go, yep, yeah, I've got a book, I need to stop? <laughs> well, in fact, once I got the book, I'd written, um, quite a lengthy first draft and then um, I found an agent and he found a book offer for me um, from a publisher but at that point they, he said could you write a couple more chapters so I was sort of adding to it even when I thought I'd finished so um, I think that's the, certainly the, the Scotland chapter and the, and the Spain chapter both came a little bit later but um, it was lovely to include them especially because it gave me a chance to see the um, the place in, in Scotland where swifts nest in old woodpecker holes in dead trees. And that's just, there are only about six trees in the UK where they do that. Marvellous. I mean, for those that are watching that haven't yet read the book, do read it. It's just an extraordinary journey. So, so, so much information in it. And a lot of it, so a lot of it really surprised me. So where you've got like the swift wing is similar to the human arm. And I was like, this is fascinating. Like it was blowing my mind reading it because it things I would never have considered. Like when you were doing all this extraordinary, this extraordinary journey of talking to all these different people, looking in the history of Swift, were there things for you that sort of stood out as that surprised you that you found out? There's almost no aspect of the Swift's life that didn't amaze me because they are the most aerial of birds. Um, and to see a creature so perfectly attuned to the glow and then attuned to a life in the air, a bird that never lands unless it's brought down by bad weather um, or for, for nesting. Nesting is the only time they deliberately touch a hard surface, a hard horizontal surface um, because they find all their food in the air, they drink in the air, they sleep in the air. They preen in the air and they even mate in the air. Um, but yes, just extraordinary that they're so perfectly attuned to the weather, to, to the life and all their adaption, adaptations to um, breeding in different places like the Northern Hemisphere. Britain, it's quite cold and rainy, but Swifts have a particular adaptation for dealing with that. Um, so their eggs, after, if, after they've incubated, been incubated for a short while, are actually resistant to chilling. So if, if, there's, if it's cold and rainy and there's not much around for the swift parents to eat, they might actually go off somewhere else. They'll fly off 
a hundred miles or wherever because it's nothing to a swift. Um, they'll go, they might go somewhere for a few days, feed up, keep their own strength up and come back and the eggs will have just, they'll be fine. Um, and the same with the nestlings. Once they've reached, put on a little bit of fat, again, if the weather's awful, the parents might disappear, but then feed themselves up, come back, so the, chick, the chicks will go into a sort of torpor. Um, but there's no, this is just incredibly rare hummingbirds to which swifts are related. It is, the hummingbird is actually their closest relative. Um, the, the adults can actually go into a bit of torpor at night, um, but swifts, it's just with the chick, just the chicks, not the adults at all. It helps them survive. And one, of, one of the other things that really stunned me is that in the past, it was believed that birds um, hibernated on the moon or at the bottom of ponds. I was I like, know. this... There are some extraordinary theories around, and they just look mad to us now. But at the time, you know, Gilbert White, a really excellent naturalist, but he'd heard anecdotes, he'd heard stories from people talking about how swifts have been found in old ruins and brought back to life when put near to a fire and but then of course suffocated because they put them in paper bags and oh anyway um so extraordinary stories Gilbert White knew about migration he knew that many birds did migrate but it just seemed a really difficult thing to believe that little birds that had just fledged could make that immense journey to Africa um, when the days were getting shorter and when had they had time to flex their muscles and 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 and, yeah. and have the strength to make that journey. So they, in some ways it made more sense to certain people that they would migrate and obviously certain like amphibians do you hibernate at the bottom of ponds. But then there were other people, there was a scientist in Italy, um, around about the same time, he was just saying, no way do birds use swift and swallows hibernate. So there were contrary opinions, but there were an awful lot who did actually um, suspect there could be some truth in it. And although it's like fantastical as it sounds, them going to the moon, which, yeah, yeah, or like, you know, swallows going to the moon or swifts like going to the bottom of the sea uh, or a pond, they're actually, you, you just touched upon it a little bit there, Sarah, what they actually do is still equally quite extraordinary. Yeah. So what, what do UK swifts do? Um, well, from the swift nestling, takes about 40 days roughly from hatching to fledging. Um, so it's nesting in this little dark hole under your eaves with a bit of luck. They haven't been blocked off. Um, and from the moment they fledge, they're, and this is, I have to just go back here because this is one of the reasons that they like to nest high up is because it gives them just a little second more time to get their wings together and fly. Um, so they're out of that hole where they've been doing press ups to strengthen their wings by pushing up on their wingtips. Um, but yes, yeah, so when they leave the nest, they're off pretty well straight away. Um, they don't hang about, they don't need their parents to show them the way, they're just off down to Africa. Um, and they'll, from that moment when they leave the nest, they're on the wing, um, all the time until they come back the following year. Um, and while swifts don't normally breed success successfully until their third or fourth year, um, they do the, the juvenile, well, the immature birds will come back even though they're not going to breed because they'll start looking for a nest, a nesting hole, um, and a mate, and claiming that nesting hole. And that is a crucial thing. They are very, very sight faithful. Um, so um, finding that nest, defending it, and um, even starting to find a few feathers to put in that place, 
make the nest because obviously where does the swift find its nesting materials? In the air. It's not going to pick up sticks or mud or anything like that. It's just got to find like tree seed or feathers, little bit wisps of hay, whatever it can find in the air. And then it all gets glued together in, with glue, I say, with their own saliva into this tiny little dish. It's not much for nest, but it's enough to stop the eggs rolling around. And as you've already talked about, Sarah, like the fact that they live the majority of their lives in the air, they do pretty much everything in the air. Um, one, of the, one of the things you've talked about is that they sleep in the air. And you write about it in your book. How do they do that? Well, it's thought that they sleep with just half their brain at a time. <laughs> um, so they kind of slow down mentally, but there's they're still slightly alert, so they're not going to fall out of the sky. Um, and they rise up in the evening. Um, the non-breeders will do this when they come over here. Um, and they'll spiral up into the sky, maybe 3,000 feet, sometimes higher. Um, and perhaps, perhaps just slow down a little bit. Swings have a very distinctive sort of flat, flat glide flight. And it's thought they just do this a little bit slower. But again, that was something that people couldn't believe that they did for a very long time. Um, even into the 1950s, ornithologists were questioning whether that was actually possible. But there was scientists going up in hot air balloons and little tiny planes. And yeah, there was a report by a French airman um, flying at 10,000 feet who, who said that he seen swifts floating along. So evidence started to accrue. And then I think it was radar research in the Netherlands that actually showed this amazing, um, it, it caught the swifts, thousands of swifts rising into the air in what was to become known as the Vespers flight. So yes, but it's also thought that another reason why they do that is, um, to orient themselves. So when they go up high, they can pick up clues about the weather and you know if there's a depression coming, which way the wind's going. Um, so it's a knowledge gathering exercise as well as a place to sleep. No time is ever wasted when you're a swift, everything gets used. They really are quite extraordinary. And as, as I've already said to Sarah before we started, it just that blew, blew my mind reading the book I had no idea and one of the people you talk about in the book is David Lack who I also found really fascinating from his like his work in radar development he was quite on you know different not just the enemy let's let's check out what the birds are doing yes. um, <clears throat> which in, in World War II which I thought was really interesting and he also spent he did research with Elizabeth Silver can you tell us a little bit about that Right, so David Lack was, had, had an academic job at the Edward Gray Institute in Oxford after the, after the war, the Second World War. Um, and he was doing research, I think, into blue tit, uh, great tits to start with, at Witham Woods. Um, and he was looking for a more exciting project and ultimately settled on studying swifts, which are notoriously difficult in the museum tower in Oxford. Um, and he took on a field assistant called Elizabeth Silver. And um, yeah, and there's, there's not a huge amount about her that I found out, but I did get to speak to, because what happened was ultimately, this is, I think, very romantic. David Lack and Elizabeth Silver got married. Um, it seems to me quite romantic, but you know, they spent hours up in that tower above the streets, above the people. Um, and Elizabeth doing things like watching. She she was the first person to record a swift fight. Um, she was up there alone and she she was up there for four and a half hours watching swifts fight. Because what they do is, as, as I said earlier, they will defend their nest site vigorously and these little feet that they have have got very strong claws 
and they lock claws and one swift will try and push the other one out of the nest hole. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a battle of endurance. Um, but yes, yeah, she watched it all for four and a half hours, which I think it's quite boring because for a long time, not much is happening. But it was it, That was extraordinary that she would watch it for that long. And God, those Swiss had stamina, didn't they? It did. like, they weren't backing it, it down. No, absolutely not. No. Um, but yes, yeah, she was amazing. And she even, um, so like a lot of women in the 50s, it was very common to give up your job when you got married and had children um and she did have four children um so yes I met Andrew one of them and his and his wife and the, so they took me up into the tower um but she, um she was saying that when Elizabeth was pregnant with her first child she was going to get to the top of this tower it's a long way and you had to go up very wobbly ladders. Um, but she was even going up these perilous ladders into until about two weeks before her first child was born. But I was, it's not reckless because she'd have done that so many times. She'd have known. She's probably just second nature to her, mm. but awesome as well. And I think she did, she did maintain an interest in Swifts. Her entire life. She only died a few years ago and she was over 100. It's amazing. And I believe that they did that research over six years. They did, yeah, five or six years. Yeah, it was a long time. Yeah. Um, and they just watched every detail of their lives. So what they did was they set up nest boxes inside the tower with um, glass on the inside so they could view what was going on in the nest. Um, and this hadn't really been done before in this country. Actually, David Lack got the idea from a Swiss schoolmaster who'd done something similar to, in his own house. Um, but it was, it was, and that, those swift nest boxes are still there in the town in Oxford. Um, there are still many swifts nesting there. Numbers have fluctuated, but they're reasonably healthy at the moment, which is lovely. Um, you know, you're talking about the we're talking about the work that um, David and Elizabeth did. How important do you think that was in the understanding and learning about Swifts, them dedicating so much of their lives to doing this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and, and you know, David Lack's book is like the Swift Bible. Um, it's got so much knowledge inside it. And that was the other thing. When I was getting interested in Swifts, that book was out of print. Um, you could get copies, but it was eighty pounds on the second-hand prices, and that was another reason I thought, "Oh, come on, there should be another book about it." <laughs> um, but I mean, having said that, you can now get the book. It has been reprinted; it is available. Um, but it's it's a, it's more of an academic book, um, but it is really worth reading. And also, it was valuable because. Uh, 10 years later, there was this chap, Derek Brummel, came along wanting to make a film mm. about birds. And he made this really charming little film in the tower where David Black had done all his research. Um, it's just a half half an hour film narrated by Eric Thompson, who um, used to narrate the Magic Roundabout. So lovely voice. Um, and it just shows you the life of the swift. I met him as well he's now died but I'm so glad I met him and he could tell me his stories of how he got the film I feel like you know all the research all that you've learned must have been such an amazing journey for you and one of the things that I wondered is do you do you look at Swifts differently now you all the things that you know now about them I I look at them with great admiration I think mm -hmm. now I know I know um, and I just love them they're just beautiful words birds to watch they've got such zest they're so quick and agile and you know they bring drama to our lives they're just um ex there's, I love so many birds and creatures but yeah they are they are amazing to watch and the more you know about any kind of bird creature 
wildlife, the more fascinating it all gets. Absolutely, I think they're a marvel, aren't they? Um, one of the things that I think is really important to touch upon that obviously you talk about in your book is numbers are drastically decreasing in the years, like then they've dropped quite a lot. What are the different factors that are affecting that? Right, well, there are several factors. Yes, and you're absolutely right. Swifts actually got added to the red endangered list a year or so ago, which is pretty grim, which is a, for a bird that they are still rather, you will see them. They're not rare in the sense that you'll get twitchers flocking to see one somewhere. But what's happened is that their their numbers are in such steep decline that there's real worry that they could go extinct and that action really needs to be taken to stop that. So obviously swifts are in insectivorous um, and I think we know that there's been a massive decline in insects um, here, Europe and even in Africa, there's a lot of change happening there. So loss of insects has got to be a factor but also there are some people who think that it's because swifts are so incredibly mobile, they can always go to places where they will find the hot spots where there are lots of insects. There might be like a massive carrot fly over an oilseed rape field or something and then they'll all descend or they'll go off to over a lake where there's lots of aquatic insects and exploit them. So they are, it's true, very mobile and adaptable in that way. But another reason is loss of, a big problem is loss of nesting sites. Um, and as I said, they're very site faithful. They nest in high up places, in hole, they will find holes. Their access holes take them just under the roof. You won't see their nest. It's not like with a house martin or swallow, which makes a little mud nest on the outside of the building, under the eaves or wherever. Um, their holes are actually, their nesting holes are hidden, little dark places. Um, and a lot of, a lot, a lot of the holes in our buildings are being filled in, blocked off um, during restoration. It doesn't have to be like that. It's quite possible to have a dry, secure house and retain nesting places for swifts. It can be done. Um, but there has been a drastic loss through renovation and through new buildings being, um, again, in, they're not weathering in the same way as older buildings would have the modern construction materials, um, plastic, soffits, things like that. They don't give in the same way. So there is a big problem, but there is there are, again, this amazing Swift community I've talked about. They have been, working hard to find, and that's just individuals, lots of individuals doing things all over the place, um, working on swift nest bricks. Um, and the swift nest bricks are now commercially available. The price is coming down if you look in the right place. So what they are is basically a, a, a brick with a hole in the front. So, um, and the beauty of that is that once that swift nest brick is incorporated, integrated into the brickwork of your house, then it's there for the duration of the building. Um, and again, the swifts won't have access into your loft, into your house. It will just be a hole into a nest box, um, which will be an ideal place for them to rear their young. So nest box exterior nest boxes absolutely put those up um and play attraction calls because that does help get them in it's not so easy to get swifts into nest boxes as it is into as say blue tits will just find them in an instant swifts take and take quite a long time um but they these nest bricks again because they're integrated into the building um i think that's more like their traditional nest sites and, and I think they will be used, and they're not just used by Swifts. Um, in fact, the um, Duchy of Cornwall um, have been installing Swift nest bricks into all their developments in um, 
across their estate. Um, and in some of them, they've been surveyed and they've even found house martins going in and building their mud nests inside the boxes. Sparrows use them, hibernating butterflies use them. Um, so they are a really, really useful thing to have. Um, and there, there is a bit, well, there has been a petition underway to try and get the government to make swift nest bricks compulsory in all new builds. Um, very passionate campaign run by Hannah Bourne Taylor. Um, so there is a, a real drive to make that happen and it'd be wonderful if it did. And all of that was fantastic, Sarah, because I was going to ask for those watching, like, what can they actively do? So then there's petitions, you can get the, the nesting bricks. Is there anything else that you would recommend that people can do to try and either help the Swifts or raise awareness to the fact that they are decreasing so drastically in the last few decades? Well, there are, some, there are always lots of things you can do. One is the way you garden. Um, if you garden in a wildlife friendly way, um, having lots of plants that are good for insects, never using pesticides, um, making your garden just perhaps a little rough around the edges. So you just in, and having a pile of logs, um, which is good for, again, good for invertebrates. Just making good habitat in your garden is really helpful. Another thing you could do is um, consider a community swift nesting project. Um, it can be really good to put swift boxes up in church towers because, again, they've got wonderful height, great for swifts, and um, you're putting wooden boxes in and because they're, um, they, they will be inside, they're not going to weather, which is good. So, again, they'll be there for a long time. Um, I know, I, I, having said that, I still think it is worth people putting up boxes on the outside of their houses. You can get some that are made of um, a sort of wood crete and things like that, that last for a long time in the wooden ones where well, you can replace them if, if, if need be. So there are all sorts of things you can do. So I would encourage anyone to just do their bit for Swifts, whatever they, way they can. And I feel like writing your writing the book, uh, Sarah, you've made such an impact. And I do feel like everything that's come before, the people you talk about in the book, like David Lack and Elizabeth, well, Elizabeth Lack, as she ended up being, um, that without those people, without people like you writing this book, we wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be as easy to find out what you can do, what's happened with the Swifts, the, how it's decreased. Because if you don't have these records, if you don't investigate and observe, we would never know. Um, so I feel like it really highlights for the wildlife for us to do those kind of measures. But people like yourself, to, when you write books like this, you bring awareness to the public. Well, I'm really glad that that was something I really wanted to do. I just thought when people know the amazing stories of Swift and the problems it's facing, they will want to do something about it. Um, I, I, I really hope that's happening. And, I'm, and we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you, Sarah, I was quite curious. I think my video is getting a bit stuck, so apologies. I was watching. Um, would you ever consider writing another book? Well, I would. And I've got some ideas, but the, I'm not quite at the... I have started writing something, but I'm not. it's not like a single species, something like that. It's nature-based. I'm not quite in the right place for... Um, talking about what the project is I need to get it so it's a bit further on and then I'd be very happy to talk to you again we would love that and I did wonder when you you've obviously you spent a long time researching for your Swiss book that maybe it might be something you want to get back into absolutely I just love the like I said I love the research I love the exploration and I love the writing it's kind of I feel more myself when I do it it's a bit of a shame I didn't think about doing that for the first <laughs> few decades of my life. <laughs> but that's too bad. It's actually really lovely to find something that you enjoy doing later in life, really, as well, and to, to, to find that you can do it. So it's it's a joy. And we've we've obviously been talking about Sarah's books, Swift Swifts and Us. 
Um, I just wanted to thank everyone that's joined us live and those catching up on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for taking part in our launch event. We'll, you'll be directed to our, I think my video is really not great, so apologies. Um, you'll be directed to our World Reads page, which shows you there's another four books as part of this extraordinary promotion that, as I said, is in um, partnership with Suffolk Wildlife Trust. Do check that out. We're going to have events throughout the period in up until September, um, end of September. Um, so do have a look at the page on our website. That's going to be updated as more and more activities are confirmed. We have multiple libraries involved with the project with many copies of the books, including Sarah's amazing book about Swifts. And, you know, Sarah, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening. And thank you for writing this book that I think is so important to nature. Well, thank you, Lisa. It's been a real pleasure to be with you all and, and wonderful to be part of your Wild Reads project. And I should say it's just perfect timing as well, because now is the moment when the Swifts are coming back. I saw my first one this year, yesterday. Um, so it's a really good time to start reading about Swift and, and getting out there and looking up and, and looking out for them.